three here at Lambda stage. Ram Lambda, right? I just just woke up, had my coffee. How are you? How are you feeling? Well, good. How was the party? Amazing. Amazing. I said to everyone, you, you, you should go. So great. Yeah, the party was good. I liked it also. Uh, I, as I always say, parties that build stuff are, are kind of great. My name is Lucas once again. I'll be the moderator of this stage. And for all of you watching us at Pine, hello, wherever you are. Don't, uh, don't be afraid to ask any questions that you have. And now we are going to kick off with our presentations. And first of stage is Joe Franchetti. But, oh well. Kind of. This is not kind Joe. Of. Kind of. What happened? What happened? This is definitely not Joe. She has been here, her, her <laughs> here in, 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 my, in my bio. So this is David. Uh, but don't worry, the presentation is the same. Wearable live captions. Making mask wearing more accessible for those who are hard of hearing. Uh, so David will tell Hi. all you, uh, you all, you need to know. Why about I am it. here? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I'm tell so you a round of applause for David. So I'm desperately trying to make this work while we're while I'm stalling here and talking. So Joe um, can't make it today, unfortunately. She got dragged to the other side of the world by work. Um, why am I here talking to you? Because I want <laughs> because I worked on this with Joe. And I happen to be in the country, so I can, I can do the bit. So we're going to talk about this beautiful little device that Joe made. And it's a flexible LED display that can be mounted into a mask because lockdown was hard for everybody. Now, I am not Joe Franchetti. Um, <laughs> Joe, Joe is a lead developer advocate at a company called Abley. And um, Abley is an edge messaging platform that helps developers like yourselves build live collaborative experiences. Now, they have an evolving suite of SDKs and APIs that give you kind of the freedom and flexibility to power collaborative apps like chat and delivery tracking and other kind of real-time experiences. Now, Jo mostly is a web developer, but she has spent a lot of time dabbling in IoT devices. Um, she's previously put LEDs in her wedding dress she put um, LEDs in a Christmas jumper that responded to uh, music that was playing. And this was the latest project that involved LEDs um, because she likes things being kind of really sparkly, honestly. And um, so honestly, she, she spends a lot of time trying to be sparkly is, is the, the real short version of how this came about. Now, <laughs> move along. Oh, interesting. I downloaded the slides from Google Slides and there's, there's a missing bit in the middle. Interesting. Fine, anyway, there's meant to be a, uh, a photo of Joe's mother here, which clearly isn't happening on the slide deck. Um, so Joe's mother is a really smiley, sociable former artist. And um, the, the, problem, <laughs> the problem with Joe's mother is she was slowly losing her hearing um, on the way up to the pandemic, which is quite difficult um, and a really kind of challenging experience for her. So like many others, she relies quite heavily on lip reading. And, um, and you know what makes lip reading really difficult? The years 2020 to 2020, like 2021. So she was basically struggling to keep up com with conversation before she started losing her hearing. And during the pandemic, she found it really, really challenging to actually uh, understand and connect with people that she used to connect with, um, mostly because people's faces were obscured by masks. So um, there's a, like before we get started, there's a really, really special ask that Joe has for everyone in the room. It's very simple. If someone says to repeat, asks you to repeat themselves in a social setting, please do. They're not being horrible. They sometimes just cannot hear you. Right? Like it's super, super important. Now, as we've um, kind of got through Joe's mum's hearing loss, the one thing that's really st struck Joe and, uh, uh, you know, as developers, we're really not very good at doing accessible work. Actually, um, so the, the, the coolest thing about her mum is she has kind of a cochlear implant. Does anyone know what that is? Yeah, so like a, a little hearing aid in her head. And, um, you know, it's, it's a battery over her ear and it streams sounds, ironically, from her phone and her TV. It's quite disconcerting. You can sit in the living room and you watch Joe's mum watching TV in silence because you can listen to music directly in your head. Um, so I know that assisted technologies aren't very kind of sexy or glamorous, but actually um, 
you know, they're really important to people. So we should be doing a better job with them. So there's, there's a funny, funny story about this. So when <laughs> I say funny, it's kind of tragic. So Joe's mum had to switch over to an, an iPhone to deal with her implant because the implant she has only works with iOS, not Android. So she had to learn like a whole extra operating system just so she could hear, which is kind of horrible, really, if you think about it. And the last time Apple up updated their software, um, for 24 hours, all that the people with her specific implant could hear was screaming in, in their head because the Bluetooth protocol changed, uh, changed and they broke the software. So honestly, as engineers, we probably should do a better job than tying people to specific versions of software and hardware just because they need to hear, right? Like it's super, super important. Now, Joe likes to fix problems. Um, so her kind of her motivation going into this is she really desperately wanted to fix this problem for her mother. And inspiration struck her in the weirdest place of all. Slides do work, excellent. Now, has anyone ever been here? Anyone ever been to London? You've been, there we go, we've got someone. So this is Cyberdog in London. So Cyber, Cyberdog is um, a place you should go if you're ever over in, like ND, for, in London for NDC. Um, they basically sell rave clothing. It's, it's all um, LEDs and flashing t-shirts and like weird gothy stuff. Um, it's a really, really cool shop. And they were selling this thing, a mask with LEDs in it. Um, the next slide contains, I hope, some flashing. It does contain some flashing. Well done, Google. Um, so, so this mask had a high enough resolution for kind of fun, res uh, fun animations. And so obviously, we were walking through Camden and she bought one immediately because it's ridiculous. Um, and and the, the idea was, well, maybe we could put te text on this mat mask because the pixel array there is pretty, pretty detailed. Um, unfortunately, the display in this mask came with a built-in processor and it had its own um, app on a phone, which was very, very built in China. And I say that, this sounds like I'm being mean. Um, it, it was so built in China, it was delisted from the app store and you had to sideload it from the website when you got the manual out of the box. Um, so not to be beaten and, and realizing that maybe this mask wasn't the one and we couldn't reverse engineer it, she thought she would build her own. So that's this thing here. I'm going to take it apart in a minute and hopefully not break it. <laughs> if we break down this mask versus the one we have there, there's a bunch of different things that we need to do to, to, to make one. So it's a flexible, you need to make a flexible LED display of some kind made up of addressable LEDs. Now addressable, let me see if I can take this out. Addressable in this case means that we can send data to each of these LEDs specifically. Now, they all need to be small enough to fit in a mask. And also we need a microphone to pick up the speech, right? So some of this kind of pieces. Now the wearable display that we have here is a 28 by eight array of what we call NeoPixels. So these are very, very small LEDs with their own tiny processor, which allows them to be individually addressed and can display an RGB color varying by brightness, so it's kind of RGBA. Now, it's flexible to a degree, but you can kind of see how this bends. Um, and it's powered by a very, very small microprocessor. Now, the cool thing about it is it's just about small enough to fit in a mask and can be powered by something like this USB battery right here. And hopefully can balance on this lectern. Um, so now, while we could get a tiny, tiny microphone and solder it onto the edge here, honestly, doing audio streaming and controlling an LED array on, on small devices like this is actually, you know, kind of difficult, right? But the board does have Wi-Fi. So we have a board here in this little case. And, you know, everyone has a phone. So instead of us trying to solder uh, an, an, an audio microphone onto here or on here, we just figured that we can make a web app and use the microphone that everybody carries in their pocket and help people listen to text that way. Please. 
don't know what's happened with the slide deck where I downloaded it from <laughs> from Google. Yeah. Well, there we go. Um, so the really, really cool thing about modern web tech is we have web APIs for, for microphones and Bluetooth and audio. Now, if you've never done this stuff, it's pretty accessible, and you can get started really quickly. And um, there's, a, there's a bunch of really commodity kind of speech-to-text APIs you can use in the marketplace. So what we're, what we're going to do in this project is we're going to use Azure Cognitive Services. Has anyone seen this before? At least one. So um, Azure Cognitive Services is a suite of APIs that does um, machine learning and AI, and they commoditize it so you can access it as an API. And one of those capabilities is speech-to-text. Now, we then went on to build a, a web app. And this web app is, is a, a simple node app that uses a few packages. It uses the Azure Cognitive Services speech-to-text SDK. It uses what we call a, a matrix LED driver that talks to this thing. And it also needs a transport that sends data from the app to the microprocessor. Now, the, the fun thing is, you know, the app itself has this very, very basic UI. And I'm just going to alt-tab to it and see if it's going to connect, and it has. Now, what I'm hoping is if I reboot this now, and I hit start listening, we're going to see one, two, three, one, two, three. There we go. Is that working? Nope. There we go. <sighs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> right, perfect. OK, so, so this app is running on my desktop here. And I was terrified that that was not going to work. And basically, what we have is we have a little button that says Start Listening. And um, we have a box to show the recognized text from Cognitive Services along with some representations of the visual LEDs for, for debugging. Now, I'm going to walk you through how we built this and, and what the, 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 the code behind it looks like. So, so firstly, we, we wrapped the Azure Cognitive Services Speech SDK with this code here. Now, under the hood, the Azure Cognitive Services SDK uses the, um, the Get User Media API in a web browser. Now, if you've never done speech to text before, it lets you stream text from a microphone in, inside of a web browser. Um, it's been here for ages. It's like five or six years old, but not many people use it. Um, it allows us to prompt a user for permission, and then we use the microphone and camera of the, the device here. So my laptop is currently streaming the text that you see here. Now, when a user clicks on Start Listening, um, a function called Stream Speech from Browser gets called. It news up the Azure Cognitive Services API, and it starts streaming data to, to the cloud. Come on. Now, uh, OK, fine. There's a lot of slides here for that one, that one bit. So what we're actually doing here is we, we load the speech configuration. It connects to the microphone, and then it makes a new instance of the speech recognizer class. Now, what we have is we have this callback here. And all we're doing is we're capturing the callback result from Azure Cognitive Services and then calling like a, a, a hook that we provided an SDK. And this thing here just runs in the background, churning through text every kind of 8 to 12 seconds. And I'm going to skip through a few slides. Now, in, in the main application, what we do is we take that speech SDK and we wrap it with our own class here called Azure Cognitive Speech. And what we're doing there is we're passing a, a path that does um, the calls a server side function, and it grabs um, an API key. So we're doing this just to make sure that we don't have to embed the um, the API key for cognitive services in in our web application, because obviously if you do that, people can steal the API key and, and spend money on your account. Now the speech SDK has this this callback called on text recognized, and what we've done here is we've uh, assigned a callback that calls something called LED driver that we're going to tear down in a minute. And it sends a, a command to text.scroll with a, a color value and a speed. Now, yeah. in order to send the, the values from this laptop here that's listening to me talk now to the hardware, the, we're going to need a, a messaging protocol of some kind. Now, 
there's a, there's a protocol called MQTT. Has anyone ever used this before? Cool, so MQTT is a really, really lightweight publish and subscribe protocol for hardware devices. Now it's optimized for disconnected scenarios. Um, you know, the, the idea is that um, all your devices connect to MQTT uh, servers and you can send really, really lightweight messages that get buffered in the cloud and then they get pushed out towards uh, your hardware. Now, it's really, really perfect for these kind of processes, uh, these kind of projects because it doesn't require much CPU power to process. Now, in order to use MQTT, you need a broker of some kind. And um, that, what a broker is, is a service that is responsible for dispatching messages when you send them to the device. Um, now, in this case, the, the web app is the client and the microcontroller is the receiver. Now, the web app itself sends messages over WebSockets. So very, very standard kind of webby tech. And then um, the Ably JavaScript SDK sends, sends those messages to Ably. And Ably has this really nice capability where if you send messages over WebSockets, it will reflect those messages out over MQTT as well, which is really cool. So you kind of get it for free. Now, the microprocessor is very, very small. So it has very, very limited processing power and memory, which means the code that it needs to run needs to be as efficient as possible. Um, so really, we want to avoid doing complicated text things on the processor itself. Now, I don't know, has anyone ever done any IoT before? One of the most annoying things to do in IoT is parsing strings, right? And the reason it's annoying is because strings are kind of a memory buffer and you kind of don't know how much data you're going to get when you try to parse a string. And um, at a glance, it, it might seem like premature performance optimization to do custom string processing. You really end up doing that stuff very, very quickly if you're using devices like this. Now, to solve this kind of string parsing problem on our device, given these really, really tight constraints, what we actually ended up doing is building a really, really tightly packed binary message format. Um, so the browser app, where we have a lot of processing power, creates these very, very tightly um, serialized messages that then this piece of hardware, that again, fits inside a tiny, tiny little box, can, can pass natively. Now, where most systems will probably use JSON, you know, if you've ever done web programming, you tend to send JSON over, over HTTP. The, the binary message format here, um, there we go, there we got it, um, is basically packed down into a bunch of, of bytes. So what we do is we use control codes from the ASCII um, character spec to encode the JSON message where you would normally use kind of brackets to delineate content. So what we can really do is we can just loop over these bytes and write a big switch statement in C that detects the bytes and then starts processing. Now, what it really does, and the cool thing about it, is it takes all the complexity of passing text totally away from the device and shifts it off to the browser app that we can use. Now, in the table above here, um, the byte offset 8 could represent a single character, so that you see it here, the ASCII character code. Now, what this means is, actually, in our program, all we need to detect is, is byte 7, the now, it's really funny. These are standard ASCII things, STX, the start of text. So we, we write a loop in our C code that detects that byte and then any number of subsequent bytes until the end of text message. Now, it's pretty neat. And um, what we do is we then take so many slides here. Um, we, we take that byte stream and we, we pack it down and we send it over ably. Now, Let's take a look at how we're going to use the MQTT broker in the, in the client. So earlier on, we registered this callback to on text recognized. And um, what, what we didn't look at is how we create a connection between our browser and the LED array here. Now, there's a few things going on in this code sample, so let's, let's work through it. First, we make an instance of the Ably JavaScript client. So we pass an auth URL, which is, again, a similar thing where we just get an API key from the server. We then create a new instance of the remote matrix LED driver, which is a, a library that we're going to talk about in a minute. We provide it a display configuration, which obviously defines the, the dimensions here. And then we create a device adapter. So this Arduino device adapter takes an instance of an Ably transport. So the idea is that the device adapter is responsible for building that packed binary format. And then the, the transport is the thing that it, that it takes that then knows to send it over Ably. 
So we kind of have three moving parts here. Ah, yeah, there's underlines. That's why. Cool. Oh, same thing. Sorry. Exporting the slide deck went really badly. <laughs> um, okay, so if, in, if we were going to visualize the, um, the, the process, first our browser sends audio to Azure Cognitive Services, which returns text back to our browser, which then sends a, a, a set text message payload to Ably, which then proxies it out to the MQTT Arduino device, which then um, uses, and this has probably gone off now because it does time out, um, which then uses the NeoPixel SDK to set the values of the individual LEDs. Oh, there we go, we're back. So now that we have a way to send messages in the browser that are received by the device, Let's take a look at how we're going to read those messages because there's a lot of work that goes into sending that raw, turning that raw data into pixels. Now, the LED array driver, as we mentioned, was previously written for an, another project for, um, for wearable Christmas trump, jumpers. So what we, we ended up doing was extending this API that we've got. So the matrix driver can do a number of things. It can set single pixels in either RGB or hexadecimal. It can set pixels where the Y coordinate is optional. There we go. It can also take a, a wonderful big kind of string array like that, and you can paint pictures onto the thing as, as characters. Now, in fact, we can even send entire images to this array, but they have to be really, really very small, <laughs> otherwise they look ridiculous. Um, but for this mask, the driver needs to be extended to show text. Now. We need a text, we need an optional color, we need a scrolling speed to make this work. So as you'd imagine, scrolling text is a lot more involved than just setting individual pixels. Um, so let's take a look at how we send text and we do the scrolling mechanism on the hardware. There we go, like that. So the first thing we have to do if we want to scroll text is we need to create some kind of font. Now. This pixel font right here is one that was painted by hand that Joe made. Um, we kind of guessed that the most frequently used characters in spoken text kind of worked. And then what you have to do is you, you take that and you can you convert those letters into individual pixels. Now this, this font here is, is obviously wrapped around the screen, but in reality it's a very, very long stream of pixels. So let's take a, the le a look at the letter N, and you can see how we convert this into like a byte array to pack it down onto the hardware. So visually, it, it, it looks like this. That's a, a, an N that will fit on a, a display this size. And what we do is we give e uh, a value to each pixel, where you know a, a pixel is either black or white, so it's a 1 or a 0. And if we take the letter N, it will look like this when packed down. Now. If we take that N and we turn it into an array, it kind of looks like that. So we give a value to each of those pixels and we then take that font data and we embed it in the device. So again, what we've done is we've encoded a four by eight block of bytes into a big long array. And instead of encoding the entire alphabet by hand, what we actually did is we used a library called GIMP, which is a, like a JavaScript, like, you know, like GIMP for, for Linux. It's a, it's a JavaScript image manipulation uh, package that uh, has a built-in function that will let you convert any image to a stream of uh, bytes like that. It's pretty cool. There we go. Awesome. So looking at the font image, please just imagine this is all one line rather than wrapped around like this. Now, you may have noticed that the characters aren't all the same width because fixed width fonts are really good for programming and they're really bad for everything else. Um, so I, basically, we, this, it looks nicer, but what it means is that we need to generate a second byte array, which um, acts as an index to tell us where the characters are offset. So when we're scanning through to find our, our pixels, we pick the right letters. Now, the good thing is those two byte arrays are, are small enough that we can just embed them as variables into the, uh, the control that we put on the microcontroller here. Um, now, what it means is instead of computing all the individual pixel positions in the browser app and sending them one by one, 
we can just send a string of text and the microcontroller code can look up in this dictionary the character that we're going to set on the device. Now, cool, we've got a font. What we do is we need to work out how to display it on this thing here, on this array. And as always with hardware, it is not as simple as you would hope. Now, the thing is, there are multiple different kinds of arrays that you can buy on the market. Now, LED displays um, are made up of addressable LEDs. Now, addressable means that each LED here has a unique pixel ID. And the first LED on the strip is zero, and the second one is one, two, three, four, five. Now, there's an open source Arduino library which uh, interacts with these LEDs called um, NeoPixels, which is put out by Adafruit. It's like an open source project that you might come across quite a lot. Um, what it does is it makes it very, very simple to set individual LED arrays. But unfortunately, um, the, the address, the, the number of the, the pixel, varies based on the LED strips that you can buy. Now, there are a couple of common, common wiring patterns. There's leftmost, so you count 0, 1, 2, 3, then you go back, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There's um, number 2, which we love to refer to as snake mode, um, where you, you snake from side to side. And even in number 3, you get a horizontal and vertical snaking variations. Now, because there's so many different patterns that you can buy these strips on, and like a lot of this stuff is just bought from AliExpress and other random electronics vendors, you kind of don't know what you get until you order it, which is great. <laughs> um, so in order to make sure that the pixels that we set are, are sent to the right place, we had to build some extra logic into both the JavaScript encoding library to make sure it sends the right pixel ID, and also into the hardware so it knows the, the kind of array that it's wired up to. Now, so what we, we have here is we have like a little bit of um, configuration in C, which basically says, depending on which strip you bought, and the way you detect it is you just look at the strip and you see where the wires are plugged in. You, you set the, the GPIO pin, which is, you know, on all of these Arduino devices, there's like 11, 12 GPI, it stands for general purpose IO. And you wire your LED strip into one of them. So we give it a pin ID, we give it a, a display width and height so it can do the calculations. And then we set the index mode and the carriage return mode. So you can see here that we're indexed from the top left. So zero is the top left. And then we are snaked vertically. Now, the other thing you'll notice here is we, we set Neo G GRB and 800 kilohertz. And that's because um, <laughs> while some of these devices are RGB, some of them are GRB, and some of them are RGBA. So the format that you need to pack the pixels down into just varies based on the hardware that you buy. And if you try and look at the specs of it when you're buying them from AliExpress, there is no information until you get them. <laughs> um, we've, we've got this wrong about, I don't know, 30 times. <laughs> so we've got a web app. We send a message. We pack it into pixels. It arrives on the device. What do we do? So the first thing we do is we check the first byte for what we call a control code. So there's, if you remember when we were looking at the, the JavaScript SDK, there were four different kinds of um, commands that you could send. Each one of those is just represented by a single bit control code that we send across. Um, we, we basically find X011 for the start of the message, and the second byte tells us what kind of message we're receiving. And it's, it's literally the ASCII character P, T, or S for pixel, I forget what T means, or scroll. Pixel, text, or scroll. There we go. Um, the Arduino device driver then needs to be updated to send messages using whichever one of those um, functions that we've told it to use. So the microcontroller software is able to set, set pixels using any type of display. And the font arrays are stored in the hardware. So the missing piece is we write message handlers for those different commands. And those handlers look up the font data for each character of the message, and they push the appropriate pixels to the display. And that's kind of what we're seeing here. We're, we're reading the message mode. We're reading the speed. And then we're reading the RGB from the next subsequent fourth, fourth fifth, and sixth bytes. And then we call draw entire string. Now. When a message to display the text is received, what, what happens is the code loops through each character of text in the message and looks up the character in the embedded font dictionary. 
Now that font data gets returned from the array of bytes we saw earlier, prefixed with the width of the, the pixels, so we know how long, how, how we have to stitch the characters together. Now because the font data includes the width, when the code iterates over the subsequent characters, it basically calculates where it needs to start offsetting the pixels from going forwards. Now we call this location, funnily enough, the X position. Um, and each time a character is drawn on the display, it's width with an additional space, so the letters don't run together, uh, are concatenated. Now, as the code loops, all of the X and Y coordinates returned from the font have this position added to them to make sure that the characters are drawn in a sequence. Now, this continues until you reach the width of the display, and then we just drop all the rest of the pixels at that point. Now, so that will write text to a display, but it's not going to scroll it, right? Like we just, we're filling up a buffer. Now, writing scrolling text is mostly the same, but with one subtle change. So what we do is we set the X position to be the far right hand of the display. That means when a message is first received, the X position will be equal to the display width with no pixels drawn. And then what we do is we write a loop that decrements the X position every time we loop, which effectively scrolls that set of pixels across the display. Um, so if we set a string that has a total width of 100 pixels, it'll keep on drawing and decrementing the X position until it equals minus 100, so we get the whole string across the screen. Now, you can see the code for this here. Um, so if the message mode indicates scrolling text, we start a while loop, which updates the scroll position in the byte array that represents the, the fonted string, and it starts looping, displaying a subset of the total data until you reach the edge of the display. Now, we can implement a scroll speed by adding a time delay between every iteration of our loop. So, you know, as the animation is played, the code pauses execution every time it's scrolled. Now, the really cool thing about this is by using a, a millisecond delay in this loop, what we're effectively doing is using MQTT as a buffer. So subsequent messages aren't actually loaded onto the device, so the memory-constrained nature of the device doesn't suffer from people queuing up sentences. So you can see that as like a little bit of a lag here, um, but it's really useful because this thing has like 496 kilobytes of memory or something stupid like that. Now, that's exactly what I just said. <laughs> and the cool thing is there's the mask, right? And I actually took those photos. I'm not in them. <laughs> um, so this is, this is Joe's mum being absolutely baffled by the LED mask. And you know what, like, um, I think the funny thing is she, I'm not sure she was convinced that it was the answer to her problems, but she was absolutely bemused that, that, that all this time was spent trying to. Um, yeah, and it works, it's cool. And the nice thing is you can, you can get away with scrolling the text quite quickly and people can read it. Now obviously I've taken the, um, I've taken the mask off here, but you get like a really nice diffusing effect through it, which, which works pretty well. So there is more though. There's a few parts of this application that we haven't spoken about, otherwise, honestly, we'd be here all day. So one of them is that if you don't have a display, um, that's no problem because the text is shared inside of the application itself. And like one of the, the cool things about using Ably, because um, you know, obviously we're using a JavaScript SDK, is all of the messages being sent over WebSockets. So if someone doesn't happen to have a mask, you can load this thing on your phone and you will get a transcription that you can at least read, which is actually quite a nice. Um, so in fact, there is a, there's a URL you can visit and you'll see the, lyric, the lyrics. We're gonna go with lyrics. The lyrics of this whole talk um, displayed in the web browser. So <laughs> the other thing that's kind of cool is there's a, little, um, there's a little black bar at the bottom there. And what that actually is, is <laughs> this is ridiculous. It's a fully embedded Arduino emulator that exists in the browser that, <laughs> that we wrote because it's easier to write all this stuff in JavaScript and then translate it to C than repeatedly having to send code to the device to actually debug. So what we actually did is we, we ended up um, taking some of the NeoPixel sample code, pasted it into JavaScript, and then we just changed the code until it worked. <laughs> Right? And then every time that we called an API, we, we implemented it. So actually there's, a, there's a, a browser app here where you can see as, as divs that get colored in the things that would appear on the screen. 
I mean, it's not, I wouldn't say it's a fully featured Arduino emulator because like we only really implemented the, the, the light APIs. But yeah, it's pretty cool, actually. Um, uh, if you go there, you can actually see it. So, so this is actually really super cool and like, I, this is my favorite bit of the whole thing. So you can check it out if you get your phones out on um, github.com slash Ably Labs. We've got the code for all of this online. You can download it. So the, the, the nice thing about this is these little microprocessors cost like $7, like a tenner, 10 pounds for one of these. Um, and all you really need is the, um, the Arduino uh, development environment and a browser to run all of this code. Like it's super, super cool. Um, now, there's a bunch of other stuff um, on Able Labs if you're interested in real-time um, text and chat. There's stuff like multiplayer games, quizzes, um, collaborative editing. I don't remember the rest of the things that Able do because I don't work there. <laughs> but it's, but it, the, that legitimately, their product is pretty cool. Um, so thank you very much for listening. And if you do decide to try this out, please tweet at Joe so she knows that I did actually turn up at... 10 in the morning to do a talk on live captioning while she was at the other side of the world. Um, but yes, I'm sure she's very, very happy to talk about this project. And it's really nice to do things for your mum, isn't it? Honestly, it's nice to do things for your mum. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah, uh, yeah, Joe, you should be proud. The presentation went well. It was really interesting to listen to. And we have some questions right away. Please. To be really honest, it's not a question. It's a command. Is it, is it less of a question, a more a comment? No. Yes. Um, I want to, first of all, for you, David, I just want to really, really congratulate you. I know being a speaker myself, how, oh my God, uh, I've ever worked, difficult it is to present. This is the most salt. terrifying session I've ever done in Give my entire life. Give it another salt, <laughs> but another, sli <laughs> but another slide deck. So oh. That's the worst thing a speaker can do. So people, <laughs> Thank you, you need to, each person need to give Two green votes, two park perks. You heard it here it first. You heard it here first. Mega green. Mega <laughs> green. <laughs> one for Joe, one for, for David. Mostly for, yeah, one, one for each of us. Yeah, it was, thank you so much. It was for, smooth for, as butter. Thank you so much for tolerating it. And also thank you for the hardware for actually working because honestly, it turns off itself. It, don't worry about it. But it's super. A absolu <laughs> absolutely terrifying <laughs> that that might not have worked this morning. Nice. Never yeah. do hardware demos. <laughs> never. Never in your career. Please, never do a hardware demo. Yeah. That was a risky, risky take. Thank you for coming and tolerating me. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions to David? About no, nothing. Of, no? Stunned silence. Uh, yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I, I just want to clarify one thing about the, the Bluetooth story. Yeah, so, please. So the Bluetooth updated and, she, and the, the mother was hearing voices? Yeah, it's literally not, screaming, was, like actual like static, which actually is kind of my taste in music. Yeah. Um, but, I, I, but, I don't, I, but I don't think it was really, really great for, for, for Joe's mum. Now, the, the actual, the really interesting thing is that the, um, it's funny, once I get off the script, I can talk about this. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> the, the flexible LED display that we got from CyberDog, um, we spent six weeks trying to reverse engineer it. And like, we, we ended up decompiling the Java app that was not allowed on the App Store anymore, and it was like horribly obfuscated. And then what you can do, the cool thing about browsers these days is the web Bluetooth implementation in browsers is better than on the native, like it's better than Windows's native Bluetooth. So what we ended up doing is using kind of Wireshark and sniffing the packets. And we actually did get text scrolling across it. But um, if you, it's a shame, I don't have the other, the other device here. If you look at the back of it, it's like a really, really, I shouldn't swear, freaking weird, <laughs> weird device with memory chips on the left and right hand side and bits of the pixels are mapped directly to the memory chips. So writing a driver to scroll text on it is absolutely freaking horrible, <laughs> like, honestly horrible. And we got it working, but it was so slow because what Bluetooth does is there's like a serial protocol, much like an old school like 90s serial cable that you can scroll text across. Oh my God, like we, we actually wrote a whole JavaScript library to power that specific device. And what happened is the, um, the memory was not fast enough. So you ended up with like weird artifacts so as you scroll the text, the pixels would overlap each other. It was just horrible. So then what actually happened is after we saw that, Joe soldered this by hand. <laughs> and 
every single, yeah, the, like every single line here, the reason there's glue on the edges here is because, I mean, my hands are not steady enough, especially after like a 5 a.m. speaker drinks thing, to, 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 to get the, the, the solder points across each of these strips. So you, this, this mask originally was bought as a, a big long strip of addressable LEDs. And if you, I don't, I mean, I'm really terrible electro at electronics, but Joe is thankfully better than me. Um, she just snipped the strips up and got a little bit of solder and a little bit of wires and like made basically a snake mode device out of them. It's pretty cool. Like this is hot glued to perfection. You, you this is basically the thing. It is, but you didn't have any ideas to put it on some crowdfunding campaign to make it bigger. So you know bigger. what, so one of the things that you can do if you, if you do this kind of terribly inadvisable work by hand, um, just waving at the camera so in case she watches it, terribly inadvisable work by hand, um, is you can send <laughs> these, these things off to, to China to get fabricated. So while Chinese app developers basically write malware, you can get them to fabricate really nice uh, devices for you. And you can get kind of flexible PCBs. Now, the interesting thing is the, the one that we saw in the mask, we, we basically tried to find the hardware on AliExpress, because obviously everything is on AliExpress. And um, yeah, we hadn't got to a point where that version of the hardware was um, mass market commodity yet. So you could only buy it. You could buy it in like a pair of sunglasses which seems really distracting to me, but like you, you can buy rave glasses with LEDs in front of them. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. cool. So I think, David, I think you, you're the person with the strangest quote I heard so far, Bill stuff, which was, uh, she had to update the, the iOS to continue hearing. To conti continue hearing. Well, it's, that's what yeah. happens when okay. your mother is a frickin' cyborg. Yeah, this is the, this is the craziest <laughs> quote I heard in this whole three days. I love it. Yeah. So, uh, once again, a round of applause for David and Joe. Thank you both. Thank you. Amazing presentation. Thank you very much. We'll be back at five minutes after uh, the uh, 12. The